Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another of our, our Blenheim lockdown talks. Um, and today on International Women's Day, it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome Heather Carter, who's our very first female operations director at Blenheim. So welcome, Heather. Thanks, Antonia. It's lovely to be here. Thanks for asking me. Yes, I bet you're delighted, aren't you? <laughs> this has made your day. Yeah. No, I wish we were at the palace talking rather than from home to home you know it's, it's such a shame on a beautiful day like this and I couldn't even pull up a picture of the palace with daffodils as my, my background because I couldn't get it to work so I'm not that techie that way but uh, here we are anyway. Okay, but we'll, we'll be back there soon we'll be back there soon. So Heather um, what I'm going to do I, I'm actually going to start with a short film if I, or a short film clip. Now I mentioned that you're the first woman that we've had as ops director at Blenheim Palace in its 300 year history and in fact um, the role of an operations director or manager didn't even exist um, until 1950 and 1950 as you well know was a milestone in Blenheim's history because we opened to the public and um, what I'm going to do is just give you a taste of what it was like in those very very early days and um, it's just a short film clip of a lovely gentleman called Archie Illingworth. So let's hear what Archie has to say about those, that, well, the very early few days of Blenheim's opening, and then we'll see how your uh, role has developed. Archie, when did life at the palace begin for you? Well, looking back, I think it was March the 28th, 1950. I came for an interview, was told I could have the job, had a look through the palace and found some people sitting in the middle of the hall cleaning rusty old firearms, which were obviously going on display when the palace opened to the public on the 1st of April, which was only a few days away. So I had to rush back to Worthing, pack my bags and come back immediately. In fact, came back next day. This was the reason you went to the palace, because it was going public and needed guides? That's correct, yes. The Duke, the 10th Duke then, uh, of <laughs> course, had no idea what sort of response there was going to be from the public. Oh, not at all. I mean, we had uh, made up our minds in conference with the 10th Duke that we would take around parties of 20, which would be quite big enough, possibly extend it to 30 if we were really busy. And there were three of us there, three guides. Um, you'll find out uh, later on this proved to be absolutely impracticable. During Easter, there were real problems, weren't there? Well, during Easter, it was absolutely chaotic. There were some guests in the house, Lord Carnarvon, Lord Porchester, and the whole family had to be hauled in because there were about 2,000 people there. Mr. Jenkins, the estate agent, he said it was something like a second battle of Blenheim. <laughs> the Duchess sold guidebooks in the hall. In fact, uh, one couple asked if she would look after the baby for them uh, in a sort of carry cart. So she was left literally holding a baby while they went round the palace. Really all hands to the boat? It was all hands. I believe Lord Charles uh, decided to make a little bit of money out of it too. Ah, uh, yes. Well, he was ten years old at the time and obviously had a business streak in him because um, he saw these guidebooks being sold and we were also selling etchings of the palace autographed by the Duke. So Lord Charles went up to his playroom, picked out a few books and set up a little stall for himself outside the chapel. <laughs> he sold the books. I can't remember the price, but I know that he did charge six and six extra if he autographed them. So there, um, there's one of your predecessors, Heather. Yes. So, um, but lots has changed and lots hasn't changed, actually. If you look at the library shots and some of the other shots, it's still the same furniture and um, same lamp, same lampshade. So amazing after all these years. It is, yeah. isn't it? But if you, if you imagine up to that point, um, Dunham was very much a country estate. And so um, although there was an estate's manager or an estate's agent, uh, there wasn't someone doing your role. And it was only when the public became more and more involved. So what Archie handed over to um, a lovely gentleman called Paul Duffy, 
um, and, and Here we go well. <laughs> who, you know, bless him, we, we, we knew very well indeed. So Archie retired in 1972, and then Paul took over. And then um, I believe you took over from Paul, is that right? That, that, well, not quite right, actually. There was a bit of a gap, Paul retired, and then, uh, but I was at the palace when he retired. But I met Paul when I was a student at Oxford Polytechnic, a catering student in the early 80s. And I, we used to work for a company called Town and County Catering, who, um, well, we used to go and wait on all their lovely events, which were, were fantastic garden parties at Buckingham Palace, a Windsor Hall show, um, some private pa um, parties in private houses in London. But we also used to come to Blenheim Palace, where they had lots of um, dinners, weddings, balls, and, and they really partied in those days, in the early 80s in the palace. And 11th Duke used to entertain people like um, Princess Margaret. I remember polishing glasses in the Great Hall sat, as Archie was describing, the people sat there polishing the fire tenders or whatever it was I remember sitting in the middle of the great hall polishing champagne glasses for 600 people for a reception and Princess Margaret walking through so that was before I ever ever thought I'd end up you know working for years at Blenheim Palace I was just a student and I went off and did other things but I met Paul at that point because he was the administrator and um, quite a quite a dapper gentleman he was he was very um, forthright as well um, anyway, so I, I went off and left university and went and did other things and then came back in 1997 as a catering manager, visitor catering manager. And that's where I met Paul, um, who was still the administrator at the time. So I worked with him as administrator, but obviously I was running the catering at that time and had no idea what was going on in the palace whatsoever. Um, so yeah, worked with him then. And um, yeah, we, at that point we had 300,000 visitors and um, no events, nothing going on. And, and the catering really was um, a really good source of income for the palace, but um, quite frustrating because the palace weren't doing very much at the time. Anyway, um, Paul left, he retired and a couple of other people came in as administrators. Paul had a military background. And yes. so did his predecessor. And um, I think the people that came in afterwards weren't quite the same and, and, and didn't quite get it right. And the, the, the business was, was going backwards, not forwards. Anyway, they left. Um, and we'd also had uh, 2001, we'd had foot and mouth. Mm -hmm. um, so the visitor business had opened in the 50s to try after the war to try and drive money to, to, to the estate. But it was never really a very hardly driven commercial business. Um, but it ticked along. But then in 2001, we had foot and mouth. And of course, farming that used to be the main income for the for the, for the estate um, fell away and, and there was no income for that. So they had to look more closely at where, where they could, could make money to keep this amazing place going. And um, at that time, um, the change decided to change the management structure of the of the estate. So not, not not being run by an estate agent to bring in a business manager, a chief executive and and some directors to work with the trustees to to to, to drive the business because they had to start. Create, we were in debt at this point. We need to start you know, earning money. Um, and so a new chief executive, chief executive came in and um, started putting the wheels in motion to, to make this a commercial business. And with a background in, in the leisure tourist business, he brought that experience with him. Um, and at this point, I was still the catering manager banging on doors saying, I'm really frustrated. We're making money here and we want to make more. We want to do things in the palace. And I wanted to do big parties like I worked on when I was a student that weren't happening. And, um, and in the end, um, the duke and and the chief executive said well if you if you really want to do this you know um come and come and have the job with as the head of operations and i said well that's all well and good but i know nothing about guided tours artifacts the history of the palace i've been in the basement being a catering manager nothing about you know how to, how to look after the place traffic management events nothing like that at all and um they said well don't worry we'll help you so <laughs> i took the job and um, it, was, it, was, it was quite overwhelming to start with, to be honest, but there are so many experts out there in this world and so many amazing people. So as long as you're not shy to reach out, um, you know, the help was there. And, and to work in an amazing place like Blenheim was such an honour to have been, you know, given that chance. I think um, it's interesting what you said. Something I remember quite clearly um, is that... You, you know, you say there are lots of people out there that you can ask. And I, I remember that you, you and Paul used to still have long conversations about things. And yeah, you know, well, 
Because they unfortunately we lost Paul um, yeah. through COVID earlier, well, uh, early last year, so almost a year ago. Um, but until then, he was my he was my mentor for years. Yeah. Um, yeah, I used to reach out to him all the time, and and he would, um, yeah, he would dig back in his memories and and share his advice. And and you know, he was such a wealth of knowledge. He was a fantastic man. Yeah, no, but but you see, um, you have to be careful what you wish for in the world, really, Heather. So you got your wish, and you started um, you started doing all sorts of events, and we're we're just going to have a look at some of the things that you've been doing. You also mentioned, of course, looking after the house, looking after visitors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's all that as well, um, and the um, the annual events that you're. Yeah, we were a very, very small team in those days, so it wasn't a question of you had somebody to look after the collection and somebody to look after events and somebody to, to look after ticketing. We were a very small team, as you know, because you joined us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, we all did everything. We did. And we did. It was great. I can remember sitting one day um, and the dress that the ninth and 10th Duchesses had worn to the coronation there were bits falling off it and I can remember sitting with a colleague and stitching bits on this this dress which we probably wouldn't do today no we probably um, wouldn't no we never have a conservation team in place yes. but, you know in those days we didn't we didn't have these people we didn't have the resources yes. and and many of the treasure houses didn't have these people then we weren't such big businesses you know we were a private house and um in the and almost like we were the extension of the private staff looking after the, the artifacts Right, so let, let's let's have a look at some of the events, and and there are all manner of events, but this one um, I'd like to talk to you about first of all, and this is our triathlon, um, which you know again you will be able to talk about far far better than I, um, and it's become very much a fixture in our calendar now, hasn't it? It has actually. I can't remember how many years. Probably about fourteen years. I can't remember exactly, but um, I remember the first triathlon when it came, and um, and I was a bit unsure because yeah, the World Heritage Site, and suddenly we're turning it over to people speeding around on bikes and running and swimming in the lake, and I was a bit unsure about how it was going to work. But you know what? It's 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 an amazing event. It's been running for several several years, worth I say now, and um, it raises a lot of money for charity. It's something that everybody can engage with. It's different to our normal, you know, run of the run of the day business where people come to see a beautiful historic house. This is a complex takes on a completely different feel. You know, you're cheering people on, you're swimming in the lake and racing and and raising um, a great amount of money. But it comes in and it goes quite quickly. We we set up for literally four days beforehand mm -hmm. and well rehearsed in how they're set up, and they're literally gone two days afterwards. And, and um, the pictures and the shots of, you know, of, of the event go all around the world. So it's, it's, it's really great to showcase Blenheim doing something different. Have you ever taken part in it, Heather? No. <laughs> <laughs> your, your daughter has, hasn't she? She has, but I'm too busy. I reckon I work twice as hard as those athletes <laughs> around on that day. Well, I did anyway. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, in the early days, we were we had to be on top of everything to make sure they weren't damaging verges and, you know, everybody mm -hmm. was being respectful of what they were doing. So in the early days, we did an awful lot of running around to make sure everything was right. And, you know, and actually to make sure that Fire Brigade could still get on site, you know, and, and an ambulance could still move around because we were still responsible for the for the for the um for the for the audience for the people coming to watch spectators mm -hmm. but also for the fabric of the building so there's all sorts of other things to consider not just getting people in to run around yeah. around the but, it, but as you say um it, it, it's not just the competitors and part of it is making sure that um the visitors who have come to see the palace rather than the event are are safe and you know they're not knocked over by a bicycle or whatever and also, also to make sure that the duke if he's at home can get out when he wants to that's yeah, that so was true. A good thing. Yes. <laughs> because of course the the great hall uh, not the great hall the great court um, is where all the bicycles are. Isn't exactly. It? So yeah. he had to park his car somewhere else, but he still had to get across the racetrack to get out. That's true. The, the so, so what what happened here? Ah, well, <laughs> we, we, you have those moments that you'll never forget. So this was um, literally the night before the triathlon. So we have to build um, pedestrian bridges over the bike track. Um, so that we can get pedestrians from the car park to the palace or, you know, or spectators just to, to see the event. And um, the bridges go up overnight the days before the event, a couple of days before. And we had 
um, staff and barriers, the other side of the bridge, stopping coaches going on lorries or anything big going through this bridge, they could go out another way, didn't need to go this way, although this is their usual route. And you, unfortunately, the member of staff happened to look the other way and this coach somehow, and don't ask me how, managed to sneak past them. And um, this was sent to me, <laughs> a picture from somebody's phone saying, oh no, look what's happened. Um, and, and, the, and the coach was stuck under the bridge and which was actually potentially could have cancelled the event. It was a nightmare. So there was a few hours of sweating because that was a huge event to cancel just because we've got a, a coach stuck under the bridge. Um, but anyway, it all worked out all right in the, in the end. So that's one of those um, one of those moments. So did that happen on day one of the event? No, that happened the night before. Oh, so the night oh. Get right. crikey. Oh, I see. And and the coach, I, I believe you said it was carrying a, a, a tour part. A, yes, it was. Part yeah. of your visitors. So did the coach have to just sit there until you could? So I think they had to send another coach out to get the right. coach the coach party back to their hotel. So, yeah, the coach was stuck there for a few hours. What a but, um, but in this way now, not only do we have somebody stood there, signage, barriers, hazard tape, the whole lot now. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Heather, it would have been a terrible thing, but I believe the palace almost caught fire under your watch. Yes. <laughs> You're bringing up all my special moments. <laughs> so this was um, a few years ago. It was something like the 28th of December. The palace was closed to visitors at that time. Um, but the Duke was in residence and, um, and actually we had a private party, a ball that was going to be in the palace that night. So we were all gaily getting ready, but there was a nervousness about whether the, the ball would be able to take place because of the snow. But the organisers de had decided, yes, you know, they could get enough people to come to make it worthwhile. But then just after lunch, the fire alarms went off and um, there'd been some workmen working up on, on, the, on the roof. And somehow a bird's nest had started smouldering in the in, in the eaves, so under the under the roof states. Uh, and um, the fire brigade were called. Actually, lots of fire engines came, uh, <laughs> and they 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 couldn't tell whether the fire had spread or not because it's it, there's lots of old um, wood up there. So they were very nervous that there might be something might which might combust into a fire later on. Oh but we had a, an event organizer panicking now because not only did she not have enough guests. Well, potentially because of the snow, but actually, could they go ahead because of we could have a fire? Did a duke in the building who said, "We've had this before, and I'm not leaving," and a fire officer saying, "Get everybody out," <laughs> and it was one of those one of those days that you just you, you never forget. As it was, there was no fire, and the duke didn't leave the building, and the evening event took place. Excellent. <laughs> on a you know. A, a, even more serious note, really. When Windsor Castle caught fire, that must have been a real wake-up call in terms of, you know, it disaster was. plans and all that sort of thing. It was. It was a long. Actually, it was before I started at Blenheim, in, 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 yeah. even in my catering role. And I, I remember driving down the M4 and watching Windsor Castle with St George's Chapel on fire, and I could see it. Um, so yes, and then to come to somewhere like Blenheim and realise you were responsible mm, for goodness. the the safety and the fire safety in the building, it, it's it was a huge huge responsibility and still is, um, because there are so many voids and the buildings weren't built to be fireproof in in the no. days when they built. So we've done an awful lot of work in the last few years to put in um, car, car to put in safety barriers to stop fire spread, etc. But that work hadn't happened at this time. Um, so, it, it, you know, it, it, it was quite frightening because, you know, there could have been a fire in, in the eaves and what the fire brigade did, they sent somebody back every hour to scan. They could oh, scan the right. heat. Yeah. Um, so we had the, and the ball was going on on the other side of the palace, so on the west side, and this was on the east side. So we, we managed to negotiate with the fire officer that the ball could still go, go ahead, knowing that we were monitoring what was happening on this side. Wow. And the Duke still went to bed. In his bedroom underneath. <laughs> he had a choice. Okay, we'll do one more kind of calamity and then we'll move on to some more cheerful things. Okay, oh, and then this is out of the way. So tell me what's going on here. Oh, <laughs> oh I'm sweating. Um, so we saw the picture of Archie um, when they opened Easter in, in 1950, whenever year it was, and the queues. Well, this was a day I'll never forget. So it was a few years ago. We'd had a really wet Easter and spring. Um, we we had got an annual pass um, was available at this time. So what normally happened at the beginning of the year, everybody who 
the local people who would bought an annual pass came back at the beginning of the year to renew their, their, their uh, annual pass so they could come to the events and come to the palace for free throughout the next throughout the year. Um, anyway, we'd had such a wet Easter, nobody came at Easter. And what we hadn't foreseen was on the late May bank holiday, we had a scorching weekend, we had jousting on, everybody came. And where they had a queue going around the Great Court, we literally had four queues going back from the from the palace back to, into the car park. And it was just horrendous. People don't like queuing these days. In the 50s, I think they look quite happy. They, these people were not happy people. And there was <laughs> nothing we could do. They didn't want to go home. They didn't want to not queue. Um, and they were going to stand in the heat and queue. So um, yes, move oh, on. <laughs> okay, right. So. Going back to events, so we looked at the triathlon, uh, which is, a, as you say, it's an absolutely fantastic event. And then we do all sorts of other events. Um, so, yes. So um, when, I, when, I, when, when I started head of operations um, and the 11th June, well, we had, we'd already had some parties with, as a catering team. We'd, we'd run some events in the palace. Um, but the, the, I'd also, and I had run big banquets in London in livery halls, and, and, and that was my previous role. And so I brought some expertise with me. So um, it was lovely that we could then start having weddings, corporate events, you know, celebrations in the palace, and with different event organizers and brides and grooms. And, and everyone took, takes on a different theme. So we have some amu amazing photographs of beautiful setups in rooms. And we had some, we've had some lovely guests, some really lovely, stunning events. So these are both weddings and they, they look completely different, don't they, in different spaces? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it, it must be amazing to have your wedding reception actually in the palace. Yes, well, yeah, it's just a fantastic space and it just comes to life. It feels like you're in somebody's home, yeah. although it's very grand. It's a very, it's a very warm building. You know, it feels, it, it, it's got that, you feel, you feel like you belong in there when you're having an event. It's not as if you're putting an event on in a, in a cold hall. Yeah, it's, no, because it feels, it feels lived in. Yeah, that's in the lots of ways. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, so that, again, just to have a different flavour, this was a, a, a unique event. Um, yes, do you remember? I do. <laughs> the Olympic torch relay. So, um, yes, that's somebody I, I forget who it was wrote to the the eleventh Duke and asked whether we would be a staging post for the Olympic torch, um, and um, so we would run in with the torch and light the torch and off, off they go on the next stage. Um, which was absolutely great, but there was no funding for it, and they had no idea how many people were going to come. So, <laughs> so it was free. It was free to come in, wasn't it? As it well, was absolutely free to come in. Yeah. So we we um, and the, could we put on some events to keep people occupied? Because literally, what we were going to see is somebody running in with a torch and going again. And and at the same time, um, I think. Um, David Cameron was the prime minister and he wanted to come and see it coming. So we had a lot of dignitaries coming as well. So we organized a lunch for them in the orangery, but we, we had, we know we had no, no money really to put this event on. So you'll remember Antonio, cause you were one, but um, we asked all the staff on the estate to come and help marshal um, the people that were coming and just to keep them off the road. So the torch could get through. And we had some school children there that were doing some entertainment, but also wanted to watch. Um, so it, it was, a, you know, actually it was a really lovely day, but quite stressful organising because you didn't know what was going to happen. Um, and all these dignitaries around and of course there was sec security to consider around it. Um, but from, from my point, it went really, really well. But you were mentioning earlier, it was, a, your, it was one of your worst days. <laughs> if, if someone says to me, what's the worst day you've ever had at Blenheim? Um, and, and there aren't many, but this one stands out in my mind. And it was just horrible <laughs> because as you say that the, the, I don't know how many people were there but it must have been tens of thousands of people the, 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 yeah I think it was about 12 13 thousand people so, but it felt, felt like a lot it, it did feel like a lot and, and as you say we were trying to keep the path clear for the, the runners to come in etc and um I was part of the education team at the time and with my colleague um, Karen Wiseman, we, we were keeping spaces for local school children and um, the public were, were, were abusive. <laughs> it was just horrible. And, you know, normally I, I, I'd been used to dealing with lovely teachers and kids and, and whatever, and, and it was, it scarred me for life. <laughs> <laughs> well, but no, it was, it, I'm sure, I'm sure. But no, it was a fantastic event, of course. 
Um, and then there's, you, you mentioned David Cameron being at the Olympics, but of course the, the security that was involved for, for his visit was nothing compared to the other visit that you had. <laughs> so <laughs> what's going on here? <laughs> Uh, well, uh, so at this point, um, this was when um, I think Trump was probably with us um, in the palace at this point, and we had lots of protesters outside. Um, this is the police removing them from the top of the, the gate posts on the main road. Um, but we were well and truly um, secure in the palace at this stage. So I only know what was going on from outside because my daughter was taking photographs and, and sending them to me because yes. she was on the road outside. But um, Yes, this was an experience again, not to be forgotten. Um, it was there was lots of social media around the fact that um, Trump was coming to Blenheim. Trump was coming to Blenheim, and we didn't know anything about it till, till you know it was only a few weeks before that we were sort of told that he he, he wanted to come officially, and that was a, a call from the Foreign Office to me. Um, so, yeah, so that was quite quite bizarre. Um, um, but we we had to turn around the setup very quickly, and as it was, we had to close the palace. We had huge mm -hmm. infrastructure. The palace was searched a million times, um, and you know, we worked around the clock. We had twenty four hour staffing to help this, all these searches. They searched every building, every cupboard, every drawer, every cellar, every roof yes. space twice. Once once with the ammunition teams and one with the dog team. So we had to do it all twice. And so the dogs crazy. literally had to go up on the roof and all that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, well. yes, wow. yeah, the dogs went everywhere. Gosh. But we had to find all the keys. I and mean, some of these drawers and things hadn't been open for two or three hundred years. So that was quite challenging. Um, and I think I don't think we'll ever find all those keys again because there are so many keys. Um, but it was, yeah, it was a, it was a, a, a real ex experience. I, I'd worked in, with government hospitality before, again, in, in, in my previous roles in London. So I sort of knew what to expect. I'd worked on a, as a catering manager on a couple of G7 um, events at the Tower of London and Edinburgh Castle. So, so you know, I wasn't overwhelmed, but it, I think for some of the staff, it was fair, fairly overwhelming. Yeah. Probably something they probably wouldn't want to repeat. It was, um, but it was great fun, you know, trying to work out whether we could get the beast over the Grand Bridge um, because it's it's six thousand four hundred kilograms apparently, and um, wow. and then coming into the Great Court where we've got lots of tunnels under the court, whether whether it could stand the weight. So I remember Roy and I proudly standing in front of it once it, once it was there on its trial run. And of course, we had to deny that Trump was coming to everybody to literally just before when it was announced. So when the Americans were practicing their helicopter um, um, journey, circling around the estate, and we had to say, oh, no, we don't know what that is. <laughs> and when the police barriers are going up, mm, not sure what that's for. Um, so we weren't allowed to talk about it at all. So it was, um, yeah, very secret, but the best, the worst kept secret, really. Yeah. Yeah. Heather, in that situation, you know, are you at liberty to, to say, actually, no, we can't do this? Or, or, you know, when you have a request from Home Office or whatever, is it a request or is it a, an order, as it were? Um, I think we probably could have said no. I mean, that, that decision wouldn't have been mine. That was that's the trustees and, and the Duke. But um, I, if they decided it really, you know, didn't want to do it, I'm sure that they could they could say no. I think so. But I, um, why would we? The, the photographs yeah. the went around the world, um, and and you know, some of our our, our trustees and people know the, the American um, president. <laughs> But it's a piece of history as well. I mean, that's a piece of history. You know, it's it, it is. I think what you know, whatever your feelings might be about it, it, it you've got to look at it in the wider context. Yeah, and he um, loved coming. Actually, loved coming to see the Churchill exhibition and yeah. and um, and meeting the family. And in fact, um, they all got on. We were chatting so so much about Churchill and the and the and the palace and everything. Um, <laughs> they got stuck in the Churchill exhibition, and and the aide was trying to get me to go in and get them out. And in the end, Lady Henrietta said she'd do it, and she went and got them <laughs> out because all the guests were arriving and waiting, yeah. and, and and they were stuck having a nice chinwag about um, about Winston right, Churchill. Right. <laughs> who, who of course was a, an honorary American citizen so exactly. yeah excellent okay um so slightly different times again just to to really emphasize the variety of things that go on at Blenheim um, and this was in 2016 wasn't it 
um, was. Yes. And a, a particularly nice event, I think, wasn't it? Well, it was, yeah, it was a lovely event. Again, it was quite daunting to organise it because this is the Dior fashion show where they took over the whole palace. Um, and in state, we had people sitting in state rooms. You can see this picture now, which we just normally would never do. They're sacred rooms. But mm. Dior had a fashion show in the 50s at Blenheim, which was to raise money for the Red Cross. So the 10th Duchess um, organized that as a fundraiser. So it was absolutely lovely to have Dior back in the palace all these years later. Uh, and Dior really wanted to do this, to reconstruct what was quite a famous um, fashion show in the 50s to, to, to re just revamp it. So um, it was it was amazing, and we had a lot of people. Uh, we had people sat throughout the whole palace. Um, you can see that the runways of the the models are very different today than yes. they were in the fifties. Um, it was and and the and the actual show lasted twelve minutes, but again we worked twenty four hours for several days to get this 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 re this, this this show ready. Um, obviously with with the planners. And um, it, well, the show lasted 12 minutes, but it was the wettest day of the year, if you remember. Oh, I do. I do. All it was these a... amazing people arrived, dressed up to the nines in yeah. their beautiful clothes, <laughs> absolutely soaking wet and freezing cold. Uh, and it was, yeah, one of those... It was the end of May, wasn't it? I think 31st of May? 31st of May, yeah. No, they came, yeah. came out on the Orient Express from London. Um, to the train station, but the, the, the Orient Express was too too long for our local station, so they had to go to, I think it was to Charlbury, which is several stations down the road. <laughs> and, oh, down the, down the track. So, oh. and then they had to be black cabbed all the way back again. So it was, um, yeah, it was very logistically challenging, I think. Well, they, this this is, um, in fact, the, the map of the route that the models took in the 1950s and what makes me smile about this is that it's a little hand-drawn map with hand written notes on it and if you compare that to, to what you would have had to do it, it just you know doesn't uh, it doesn't yeah, pages and pages of plans exactly and and this is a shot of um, one of the mannequins as they were called in the 1950s um, and another one and again you can see them sitting in the saloon that time as I think they oh no they didn't sit in the saloon in 2016 did they they I did think I they, think that's that is the saloon they're sat in yeah but with the, oh, no, no no they didn't no because we had um we had an afternoon tea in there that was all set ready to go but a lot of people left before the tea because they were so wet and cold <laughs> <laughs> but what I also love about this is Archie again was one of the models um and and I can't imagine you standing with a glass of champagne and a cigarette and your little Blenheim coat with the Blenheim guide written on it, you know, enjoying this. And I think if we may, I'm just indulge me, we're, we're just going to um, have a little look at Archie and he'll tell us about what happened when he did the all. There were two big fashion shows in the palace, the first in 1954 when Christian Dior showed his Paris winter collection and amongst the guests was Princess Margaret. So have you many memories of that show? I remember all the models arriving together with dresses and heavens knows hangers on, heavens knows all who, and they were coming along into the hall and carrying bags and saying, que fait on avec les bagages? And uh, my French <laughs> isn't what it should be and I... Being a gentleman, I didn't want to tell them what to do with their lay by guys. The show eventually came along, and uh, after the show, the Duchess asked me to stand, uh, keep close behind Princess Margaret and see that she was not jostled going along to the main door in the Great Hall, because that is where the, they had been selling raffle tickets, actually, for a DR dress, and that is where Princess Margaret was going to draw the winning ticket. She did draw the winning ticket. The name was read, and, and the number was read out, and I heard the Duchess say, um, oh, that's one of the local farmers. <laughs> um, they both seem to find this rather amusing. I rather think uh, they were wondering how he would look in a DR dress. 
I love that. I, I, I just think it's it's so different. And, you know, Archie's saying about the raffle ticket and with that um, that event, they you could actually just buy a ticket. You, it cost five guineas, whereas the one that that we had at that time um, was by invitation only, as you know. It was, wasn't it? Amazing invitations as well. But wasn't it lovely? We had some of the 1950s dresses on display in the Great Hall, if you remember, and they were absolutely beautiful and, and, and you know, just completely um, kept in immaculate condition. It was, it was lovely to have them back. It, no, it certainly was. It certainly was. Um, so um, just to, we'll move on from Archie now, if we may. And one of the other things that you're very much involved in, um, of course, is when Hollywood comes to <laughs> Lenham. <laughs> chaos and, arrives, you mean? Well, more chaos. I think sometimes, you know, just thinking about what we've been talking about so far, you just think, is there ever a quiet, normal day? But then given the year we've had, we've had too many quiet days now, haven't we really? It's we time have, to... although we did have a bit of filming for Cinderella at the beginning of the year, which is uh -huh. yet to come out. But um, yeah, I, we, 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 we seem to, filming comes all at once or not at all. We seem to have a couple of years gaps and then it all comes again. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think the team at the end of some years to look back and think, well, that was an amazing year. How did we manage to deliver all of that? Yeah. Um, but filming is very um, lucrative. It brings, you pay a lot of money to come and film in a, in a place such as Blenheim. Um, so it's it's worth the extra effort to, for us to do it. It's also great fun. You know, we meet, we meet the stars and, and they, cry, they try and turn the palace into to other things yes um, and, and we, of course we're there to police them and make sure that they they don't damage the fabric of the building or anything in it so it's quite challenging but I think everybody enjoys it yeah and, and, then, yeah. and then seeing it on the big screen later look I think you know it's surprising I think there was a survey recently um that was conducted by a, a local furniture store that said that of all the stately homes Blenheim comes out top in the number of times it's been used as a location Oh, really? Well, I, back in Archer's time, where it was, um, they had Ham. Well, actually, I think it was Paul Duffy. They had Hamlet and yes. Black Beauty, didn't they? So they did. even before I was there, we had filming. But we seem to have had quite a few films in my time at the palace, and I've got to know some of the location managers quite well now. Um, look, which is this one, Heather? This is this, this is one of this, the. This is this is Harry Potter. This is out out in the um out in the park. Actually, they didn't come into the palace. They had a huge unit base at the Pleasure Gardens. And then they filmed um, around this tree. They were there for several days, filming the same scene over and over again, which is quite incredible. And of course, um, it's, it drew quite a big crowd to come and watch because you know who wouldn't go and watch Harry Potter being filmed? And and that that's him himself stood there. Um, but they, yeah, I mean, we now have a, a, a film trail, and we're on part of the Harry Potter film trail as well. People come just to see that yeah. tree, so we're trying. See, Sorry, go on. I was going to say, we're trying to keep the tree standing because it's getting quite old now. So if you, if you go and see it, you'll see it's wired up a little bit. So it's, keep it holding together. I, I find it fascinating, you know, saying that they were filming for days and of course the setup, you know, setting up their little village takes a while. And if you, this is from Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. And if you actually look at it, it's, it's on for about 20 seconds. Yes. It's just absolutely incredible, isn't it? It's always frustrating though, because you want it to be on there for longer, because yeah. sometimes they filmed for days and if you blink, you feel, you miss it. Yeah. And, and, and of course, um, you know, sometimes we pretend to be something we're not. So um, you'll remember Spectre when we were Rome. <laughs> We were. were Rome and um, yeah this was one of those um, sort of nail-biting moments because the cars were speeding in and out of the archways. Um, sometimes it, it, this, this looks like a, well this was a normal car but we had um, film cars where you had a camera sat on top of the roof of the car and the person was literally on top of the roof was driving the car at speed through these archways yeah. and just thinking oh my goodness what about the palace, what about the, uh, the stonework, don't hit the stonework. Um, but yeah, this was this was an amazing film and, and filmed in December. It was absolutely freezing cold and filmed at night time. So we have we had speeding cars and we had gunshots, um, which upset the neighbours a little bit. So we had to we had to calm them down. Um, but yeah, the, the palace looks amazing because you do get that view of the palace in yeah. the film, which is great. Yeah. No, absolutely. And then um, this is an earlier one. This was Gulliver's Travels. Um, 
and again they were there for weeks weren't they they were absolutely weeks and in fact the stars moved into woodstock um and uh, jack black was staying at the bear as was billy Connolly, um kate winslet um uh, we, had, we had all sorts of people staying locally and um it was great because in between shooting scenes the stars didn't have you know they were just hanging around so billy Connolly was fantastic oh you see <laughs> He went to met the bride and groom, um, who who unfortunately were a bit upset that we got big filming on when they, when they were having their wedding. But he said, "Don't worry, I'll sort it." And um, he did. He looked after them and entertained them. And I don't think like, they'll ever forget their wedding day. Not only because that's the day they got married, but the day that Billy Connolly entertained them. And um, and he also used to meet the, um, the the coach groups coming. He used to walk out to the coach park and meet them and walk them up to the front steps of the palace. And I mean. <laughs> What an amazing surprise for these people arriving. But they shot so many scenes. There's a huge baseball scene that they, they, they filmed. They built the set in the middle of the Great Court. I remember they painted it three times because the director didn't like the colour. They shot the scene over several days and then it wasn't in the film. Um, it's, it's incredible, isn't it? Have there been, you, you said that you know, you're, you're very lucky and you, you tend to meet a lot of the stars. You met Tom Cruise, you met Alan Rickman etc etc um are they all quite do you find they are all quite friendly um sean connery came a couple of times as well um well sean connery yes he used to wave from his go to get his his um his golf cart he always went around on a golf buggy thingy he was always waving um i'd say 99 percent they're very lovely and charming um occasionally they're a bit nervous to the public there's one or two who absolutely are not and just do not want to engage do not want to talk and actually have, they're just there to do their bit and go home um but but that's fine you know we're not we don't expect them to to, to, yeah, to, to make the riffraff like us <laughs> and do you did you meet daniel craig no he didn't like to talk no i saw him i saw him in um uh, pigeon court and he was coming towards me in his tuxedo and things and he looked very focused yeah I think he was very very focused yeah. he, he, he was one I mean obviously he wasn't rude at all but he was he was surrounded by his his guards and he yeah. was very focused on the filming so but he was filming mostly late at night so again it, and it was freezing cold so he's not yeah. He weren't standing around but in the summer this was a really lovely lovely summer yes. so they all stood around chatting um in, in, for Bond and, and even Mission Impossible, they, and uh, they, you know, as soon as they finished, they were off into the warm. Yeah, don't blame them. Don't no. blame them at all. Um, so, one of the other things that, and again, I can only keep stressing, as well as the everyday, you know, anything that's going on. You're you're very very much involved in exhibitions that um, pop up at Blenheim, and again, um, I I think there are re a reasonably relatively new things so I mean certainly when I joined in 2008 um, there was a little teeny tiny something in the um, riding school mm -hmm. um, but but now it's, so, like, um, it's a bit like a, events you know um, we, we launched our exhibitions because we wanted we wanted another reason for people to visit so lots of people come to Blenheim Palace once and you see the palace and you learn the history but we wanted other reasons for people to come back, something else for, for them to see. Yeah. So we started with exhibitions in out in out in the outer, outer buildings, um, and which worked really really well. But then I think a few years ago we started them sort of putting them through the palace, um, and and this is one that you worked on, a passion mm -hmm. for fashion, which is. It was absolutely beautiful. We had some stunning costumes and um, and dresses from films um, that we had we'd had and 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 I think that's the Diana dress there, isn't it? That's her. It is the the revenge dress, indeed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so absolutely amazing. So so that's worked really well for us, and and we're about to launch a new exhibition when we when we reopen with Cecil Beaton's photographs through the palace, mm -hmm. which are going to again look stunning, um, just carefully placed through the through the state rooms, and of course Cecil Beaton has. A history of of, of of photographing the Marlborough family, so yes, there's a really lovely connection there. And um, you're also working on a couple of permanent exhibits because the Cecil Beaton will run for a certain length of time, won't it? And then um, you're you're working on revamping and recreating yeah. a couple of new yeah. exhibitions. Yes, you, it's funny you should mention that, Antonia. <laughs> So since, since before 2020, before COVID hit, we'd started looking at our visitor business and what we've achieved over the last you know, 15, 20 years. And, 
And what do we want to do now? You know, you can't you can't stand still. There's lots of competition out there for people's times. And, you know, we want people to keep coming back to Blenheim and we've got to move with the times and you've got to revamp your exhibitions and just keep people interested in people's people's um, sort of concentration wants and, 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 and needs are different to what they were 15, 20 years ago. So so we've already started doing some work as re, re looking at our, our proposition, if you like. Yeah. Um, but COVID hit and um, that sort of slowed down a bit. But at the same time, we managed to apply for some cultural recovery fund grant money to reopen the business in a COVID safe way. And we'd already identified in 2019 when we were doing our research work that 22% of our visitors come to see Winston Churchill. But we've got this, yes. we have a very small Winston Churchill exhibition in a small space. Well, we had to close that during COVID, but, 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 by, but by moving that to a new space we'd already identified, we can open that even if we have um, yes. social distancing um, in place. So, so we've brought that project forward, something we were going to do, managed to get funding to help us do that. Mm -hmm. So we're moving the Winston Churchill exhibition and revamping it, creating a new experience and putting it into our water terraces. We've moved a cafe that was in that space and we're creating a new cafe in our stables courtyard. And at the same time, we're revamping our stables exhibition to tell the stories of stables and the social history of horses on the awesome. estate and to really create a, a, a new experience there again so that when people come even if we've got social distancing they can spread out and see different things but there was mm -hmm. the, the exhibition and the stables had been there over 20 years I think so it was time for a change yeah, so it was absolutely. really exciting so behind the scenes you know we have been working really really hard over the last few months to 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 the research and to get the props built and the storytelling and 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 to live and physically build these exhibitions in these spaces so really exciting that we could be opening these in may um, when the paths reopens excellent okay so um i've got a couple of questions for you heather if that's okay um so um well i think Blenheim is unique in many ways as you say not only because it's Churchill's birthplace which which you know, thankfully for us, um, happened, or even though it wasn't meant to. Um, we're also pretty unique and, and very special because we're still a family home. So part of your role has to be, presumably, to liaise with the family. Um, it's, it's not, you know, presumably you don't have complete autonomy in what you choose to do. So how, how does that work? No, we always have to res be respectful that it is a family home. But however, the family appreciate that the you know the income from the visitor business and the events and everything we do goes towards protecting and restoring. Everything goes back into the restoration of the palace. So, uh, and the ground and the wider estate. So, it's important to them as well that we we are you know being commercial and and and, and raising money. We have to do that. But we do have to be mindful that there are certain things that actually um, it's not fair in the family for us to do. Mm. And we also have to respect at times when they might be entertaining, you know, sure. does what we're planning fit in with, with, with what, you know, what they're planning to do. So always mindful that it is family home and we should be considering what the family wants. So if we have a triathlon, and the, the Duke and Duchess decide that they actually are, you know, that weekend they're going to be coming and going and they're going to be in residence. How do we make that work? So we work together to make sure that we can make that work. If we're going to have a, a big music festival, you know, how do we make it so that they their guests can come, enjoy the music festival, get in and out of the palace safely without being disturbed by, you know, the 10,000 other people that we've got. So so always being mindful of, of, of what they want. So, yes, we talk regularly and plan together and... Um, and if there's any problems, we try and iron, iron them out before we get to, to having a problem. So, you know, right. we discuss everything. I think one of the other things about Blenheim is its situation uh, geographically. So it kind of sits almost in the centre of a small town. So does, does that present particular challenges or opportunities or, or, it, it, or it does we do try really hard to work with with our local villages because we're surrounded mm -hmm. by local villages and we don't always get it right sometimes we um for whatever reason we, we if we've got a big event we have traffic issues you know we, occasionally we've had noise issues in the past but you know we take on board all the comments and we try and put it right for the next mm -hmm. time um and if we can take action on the day we, we'll do that so i i live in woodstock yes. um, and my husband's great at phoning me saying i can hear the music 
I couldn't get I couldn't get home from Oxford. The traffic's really bad. <laughs> so I have a network of friends who are not shy to let me know what's going on. But, so, but that's but but there are advantages as well because absolutely. I mean Woodstock. It's just such a beautiful town and it's it thriving is. and it's different and. It is. And, and, you know, we, we bring in lots of economic benefit into our local communities by, by bringing people in. So, that, you know, people who are working on events, the, the local people can work on the events or work at the palace, you know, um, for, so through the education things we do, the apprenticeships that we do, um, by the tourists coming. And if we have an event that lasts for two or three days, they might stay locally, yeah. um, you know, eat in the restaurant, stay in the hotel. So, we, we bring an awful lot of economic benefit to, to, to the local communities and not just Woodstock, you know, further out than that. So it's, and I, and I think that local people know that, they appreciate mm. that, um, most of them anyway. But it's, and again, with, with my kind of history hat on, it, it's always been that way, you know, from the day the first stone was laid. And, exactly. Know. So families that moved here to help build the fab, you know, the palace, you know, generations ago, they're still, they're, they're, their family names are still, you know, in Woodstock. They are. They are indeed. And, and, and they still send their children and their, when they're leaving school to come and start work with yes. us to learn the <laughs> skills of, of dealing with general public and history. Yes. So, I think... I think it's, it always makes me smile that, you know, so many of us at Venom have, have kids that have worked there at, at some stage or another. Yeah, you know, and it does feel like a big family concern. In, in it so does, much. it does. You know, I, I was actually, I, did a, I was speaking in a webinar a couple of weeks ago and I had an email from somebody in America who'd worked, for, uh, worked at Blenheim and just wanted to reconnect and several years ago. And, you know, you, you, all, all, all parts of the world, really, with people in Korea and um, yeah. Australia, all sorts of places that, you know, keep in touch because they worked at Blenheim, which is, which is lovely, absolutely lovely. Right, I have another question for you. So, um, what's one of the most unusual things you've had to do? Do you think? Um, oh, well, there's so many to be honest. I mean, I mean, when I first started um, in my head of operations role, and we'd had our first event um, dinner in the palace where I was in charge, yeah. I had to lock up the palace on my own at night and get around with the keys and switch the lights off. And I, you know, I will never forget that night because I was, I was so nervous. I'd been shown um, how to do it, but when you're on your own and it's two o'clock in the morning and you're in a palace, not knowing if it's haunted or not, I have to say I've never, I've never met a ghost, and I've been there all night virtually at different times, and I've not met one. So um, put those theories away. Although there are people who claim, <laughs> there are people who claim they have. Um, that was one. Another one, I suppose, fire alarms in the middle of the night where I to come running in and meet the butler and um, we go up on the roof trying to find the roof void with the fire head in it we wouldn't be allowed to do that now health and safety says you yes. can't and we have to get um, a, a specialist in to, to go and sort that out or the fire brigade do it but in those days we used to be in there and we used to be in this dressing gown and we used to be on the roof trying to look for a fire head so that again something not to forget now I suppose on the event side um, one of the ones i yeah, we had a, a celebrity wedding, um, and which was being um, sponsored by, I think, Hello Magazine or OK Magazine, mm -hmm. one of them. And um, we had, or the, the event planners had forgotten to tell the bride and groom that we'd got a brownie camp going on at the bottom <laughs> of the garden. <laughs> and they weren't very happy about it and, and um, wanted me to get rid of it. Well, I couldn't get rid of it. So in the end, we ended up hiring trees from- um, I remember that. <laughs> They came on on the back of the lorry, huge trees, which we we put across the view to try and hide the view of this this marquee. Um, the only trouble was it was really, really windy. So we had to get the, the staff had to stand and hold oh, hide behind the trees, holding them up for two hours whilst the reception was going on. Oh, dear me. Yeah, you just have to think on your feet sometimes. And that was the only thing I could think of at the time. <laughs> yeah, the, it, honestly, I, I really don't know how you do this. I, I stand in absolute awe. But sorry, go on. Yeah, I can say, but you know, it, it's 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 great fun. We have amazing people, and um, yeah, everybody's up for the challenge. So it's it's, it's wonderful. Right. So um, one last thing, because it's International Women's Day. Tell me, who who do you recall? Who's the most amazing woman you've met, and and who are the women that have influenced you in your life? Um, 
I thought it was a hard one. I've met so many amazing people. Do you know, in my 35 years of being at work, I've only ever had two women bosses. Really? Yeah, which is just amazing. I was thinking about this the other day. Yeah. I mean, there are so many amazing sports people out there, historians, you know, people who are just so knowledgeable about things. Um, Michelle Obama, you know, I read her books. She's just, yeah, just, yeah, it's just so, um, I know, passionate and, yeah. you know, so, so fantastic at all that she's done. Um, I suppose, I mean, but I've also met, I met Margaret Thatcher when she was prime minister and um, I, I used to look after some of the government hospitality. So I chatted to her right. and um, Theresa May, I've met her a couple of times, not and when she came for the, the Trump visit and a couple of other things. Um, so I would say, again, they're inspiring women, whether you believe- yeah. They're, they're, they're trailblazers, aren't they? In, exactly, in their own way. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so for me, I suppose the people who inspired me most were my mother and my grandmother, who are both, you know, really independent people. And they, they taught me to stand on my own two feet and, you know, speak out and do what I believe in. And, um, and, and I think they taught me at a very early age. And that's, that's what I've always done. Well, I think on that note, Heather, thank you so much. I, I know you it took a little bit to pin you down to, to today. But it's been an absolute pleasure and I'm, I'm thrilled. Thank you so very much indeed. Thank and you, Antonia. So I hope to see you in real life one day soon. Well, I hope so, very soon. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. You. Bye bye. bye, -bye.